the United States Airborne have always been about heavy firepower and small packages. When you're hitting the combat zone from the skies, you need military tech that is deadly but lightweight. Today's airborne troop can take out his targets with his trusty M4 or bunker bust with the Javelin missile. Rewind to the paratrooper of World War II, armed with specially adapted carbines and submachine guns that could be carried into combat from the air. These weapons and the men who use them would soon be tested to their absolute limits. July 1943, the U.S. Airborne assaults the Mediterranean island of Sicily. When they got there, there was extremely high winds. There was such a dispersion of jumpers. They were scattered all over Sicily. Moffat Burris was parachuted onto the island, but soon discovered he'd been dropped way off target. They dumped us out 55 miles from the drop zone, and I never saw my unit during the entire Sicilian campaign. Despite a disastrous drop, the Airborne did what Airborne do best, hit the enemy hard and fast. At their side, tried and trusted firepower like the Thompson submachine gun. The first submachine guns, like the MP-18, were used by German troops in World War I. The Thompson would become the next deadly development. Originally produced in 1921, the Tommy gun was appreciated for its raw killing power. Now, this was loved by the airborne troops mainly because of its size, its weight, and its hitting power. Dropped deep into the heart of enemy territory, the Airborne needed a gun that was ready to fire as soon as that trooper was out of his harness. You can basically land with this on impact, load a clip into the, into the magazine well, cock it, and be ready to fire at anything that was around you. World War II paratroopers would land with a variety of weapons. Some, like the M1 Garand rifle, had to be reassembled once on the ground. This could cost precious time when under enemy fire. The Thompson hit the deck ready to rock and roll with 700 rounds per minute. Designed by General John T. Thompson, the Tommy gun was first known as the Annihilator. It's easy to see why with the hail of lead bullets that it unleashes. You could deliver a lot of large ammo real quick and inject lead poisoning to the enemy. It could save your life. They don't like to see a lot of lead coming their direction. The enemy does not. The Thompson fired a bullet that was almost half an inch thick. This slow moving lump of hot lead caused serious damage to the German and Italian defenders of Sicily. The most important thing is the stopping power of the caliber of the round. It's 0.45 inches in diameter. It's a very large cartridge, very powerful at close quarters. If an enemy gets hit with this slug, he's going down. A close quarters combat lead sprayer was crucial to U.S. airborne troops. But the Tommy gun was slow and expensive to manufacture. The next stage of development would be a cheaper, mass-produced submachine gun, the M3. This is the M3 grease gun, and this was called a grease gun because it looks like a grease gun. This is one of the great sounding weapons of all time. When this thing goes off, it makes a tremendous sound. The M3 was manufactured off of the General Motors production line at half the cost of the Thompson. This grease gun could fire 450 rounds per minute but weighed in at just over eight pounds, making it an ideal weapon for the paratroopers. The reason it was important for the paratroopers is they can actually hold this close to their chest while they're ready to exit the C-47, and they're gonna have a guy right in front of them. If they had a, an assembled Garand, or if they had a BAR, if they had a machine gun, it's gonna be very cumbersome, and you've got static lines hanging that they could get entangled with. By having this close to their chest, they had very small chance of the entanglement happening with this type of firearm. The airborne submachine guns proved essential as they fought their way through Europe. Often, the odds were stacked against them, 
even before they hit solid ground. In Sicily, when airborne reinforcements tried to reach the island, they were hit by deadly friendly fire as they flew over the Allied invasion fleet. When the airborne forces go overhead of the Navy, the Navy mistakes them as being enemy aircraft and they shot a lot of them down. 23 airborne planes would be blasted out of the sky in this friendly fire incident with over 300 Allied casualties. In the aftermath of the disasters in Sicily, the United States Airborne faced their darkest hour. General Eisenhower saw what a mess it had been in Sicily that he almost, almost terminated airborne forces in the United States. The United States Airborne had to learn from the mistakes in Sicily and learn fast. Fast forward to the night of June 5th, 1944. Despite heavy losses at Sicily, the airborne troops that touched down managed to cause widespread terror and confusion. Allied leaders realized that this was exactly what was needed as they took on Hitler's fortress Europe. Now, over 13,000 airborne troops would descend from the skies into Nazi-occupied France. Their plan? To disrupt the German forces that were set to destroy the vast invasion fleet as it hit the beaches on D-Day. The idea was that we needed every advantage against the German if we were going to win and get on shore and stay there. winds and anti-aircraft fire scattered the drop into France. The men on the ground had to regroup and become an effective fighting force as quickly as possible. A simple bit of equipment helped lost soldiers find each other. What we have here is actually a toy. It's called a cricket, but it was very important to the paratrooper because it was used as an assembly aid. And what that means is when you land in the dark, and you don't know where your other friends are, your, you know, the rest of the soldiers from your squad. So the way you find them is you'd use the cricket. And hopefully you hear a back rather than the clicking of a German gun. Another unconventional device helped the paratroopers confuse their enemy. This peculiar object is Rupert. He's a big rubber blow up doll. He is one of the dummy or decoy paratroopers that was used primarily during the D-Day. Rupert may look unconvincing now, but in the early hours of June 6, 1944, he and 500 other dolls did the trick. They night under a canopy with a soldier who's nervous about an incoming invasion. And all you see is something floating underneath a parachute. This looks very real. And so that German soldier would then probably call his higher headquarters and say he's got paratroopers. All the chaos and confusion led to the Germans' downfall on D-Day. The paratroopers were badly scattered, and that turned out to be a real plus. You can see in the reports, for example, of the German 7th Army, they said there are parachutists everywhere, literally everywhere. We, everywhere we go, at every crossroads, there's an they're Americans firing at us, and it, it, it caused a great deal of trouble. It was mission accomplished. Helped by the airborne, the invasion fleet were able to move out from their beachhead. Once again, this light infantry unit had packed a heavyweight punch. 